Mid-1944. After months of hard fighting in the southern sector of the Eastern Front, in which the Germans have lost all of Ukraine, and one of their best marshals, Erich von Manstein, the Red Army prepares to attack the Army Group Center. This powerful offensive, known as Operation Bagration, was going to deal the final blow to the German armies in Russia, and after three years of war, it was going to take the front line to East Prussia itself. As we have just indicated, after the brutal fighting that took place during the first half of 1944, this was the situation on the Eastern Front. As we see on the map, the most characteristic is the large ledge located to the south of the Pripyat swamps and northern Romania. In total, this salient, which was embedded in the German lines, had a depth of 400 kilometers and a width of 600 kilometers. From this point on, the Germans estimated that their Soviet enemies had two options. First, they could attack from the salient in a northwesterly direction and reach the Baltic coast. With this, they would pocket the entire German army group center and north, with catastrophic consequences for them. This is exactly what the Germans would have done if they found themselves in the situation of their enemy, and it was on this possible maneuver that they based their defensive strategy. On the other hand, another option that they considered feasible was for the Soviets to attack Romania and seize the vital Ploiestii oil fields. In addition, with this action, they would enter the Balkans, which was a territory that Tsarist Russia had so much claimed. However, this was never the idea of the Soviet High Command, as they knew that an operation in which they tried to reach the Baltic Sea directly would be full of risks, leaving both flanks in danger. Instead, they were going to launch a series of phased offensives against Army Group Center in the vicinity of Minsk, to later attack the sector that the Germans had planned between Cowell and Brest. In any case, the Soviets began a series of deception operations to make the Germans believe that they were going to do exactly what they had envisioned. In this way, the Germans began to fool themselves, and only saw what they wanted to see, sending most of their armored reserves to the position of Army Group Ukraine North, commanded by Walter Model. Thus, while during the day they diverted troops to the southwest, so that these movements would be seen by the Luftwaffe, during the night they brought them back. The main one that the Germans had was that they had to defend a very long front line of about 2,000 kilometers, with increasingly smaller units. Approximately, each infantry division was assigned a front width of almost 40 kilometers, turning the German defense into a real drain. Because of this weakness, it was vital for them to find out in advance what the Soviet breaking point was going to be, so that they could concentrate their panzer units there. Otherwise, the entire German defensive line would collapse with catastrophic consequences. Approximately, the Germans had barely a million men, while the Soviets far exceeded the figure of two million troops. With regard to tanks, while the Red Army had almost 6,000, the Germans were able to oppose about 1,500. And finally, and with respect to aviation, the Luftwaffe had about 1,200 aircraft, while its enemies had more than 5,000. The distribution was as follows. From north to south, the Germans had the 3rd Panzer Army, the 4th Army, the 9th and the 2nd Army. On the other hand, the Soviets had the 3rd Belarusian Front, the 2nd and 1st Belarusian Front and finally, already in the center of the salient, the 1st Ukrainian Front. Although these are the general numbers that each army had, it should be noted that the operational initiative was held by the Soviets, and this allowed them to obtain a superiority of 10 to 1 or even more, at those points on the front where they attacked. The attack began on June 22nd with a devastating artillery attack on the German defensive lines. Due to the lack of troops, the German defensive line had little depth, and once it was penetrated in any sector, the entire front would collapse. The first Soviet operation consisted of a pincer attack against the city of Vitsetsk, which was surrounded by June 25, and some 20,000 German soldiers were captured in it. With respect to the few panzer units that tried to plug these gaps, it must be said that they were completely devastated by Soviet aviation, and finished off by the Soviet armored vanguards. A day after the start of the offensive in Vitsetsk, another double attack began further south, against the cities of Magalev and Bobruisk. This was led by Rokovsky himself, who made his way at full speed through the German defenses in the direction of Minsk. 
The German response was to send part of the 9th Army that was further north, but they could do little to nothing in the face of the overwhelming Soviet advance. After a week of fighting, the Germans had lost some 100,000 troops, and both their 4th and 9th Army were completely crushed. Because the Soviets had attacked both at Vitsetsk and further south at Bobruisk, a large salient had formed on the front east of Minsk, in which more and more Germans were in danger of being completely surrounded. This being the situation, the next step for the Soviets was clear. Attack the rear of Minsk both from the north and from the south, and cut off as many Germans as possible. On the other hand, the orders that came from Hitler's headquarters in East Prussia did not help anything, since the only thing that was ordered was that they resist without giving up a meter of ground. Having lost Kiev eight months earlier, Minsk was the only major capital left to the Germans in Soviet territory, and it was there that the salient's 100,000 German soldiers had to hold out. In an attempt to stop this Soviet advance, the Germans mobilized as many troops as they could and sent them to the central sector of Army Group Center, which was off Minsk. It was at this exact moment on June 28, when Marshal Ernst Busch, who had been limited to faithfully carrying out Hitler's orders, was replaced by Walter Model, who took charge of Army Group Center to try to save the situation. From this point on, the armored reserves of the North Ukraine Army Group were sent to this sector, to try to contain the Soviet avalanche and prevent the loss of Minsk. The first measure that Model took was for all the units that were east of Minsk to withdraw towards the capital and establish new defensive positions. Regarding the reinforcements that were arriving, it must be said that they were brutally attacked by the Soviet aviation that had control of the sky, and a large part of them got lost along the way. Basically, it was what was also happening in Normandy. In addition, to this we have to add all the attacks that the numerous Soviet partisans were carrying out in the German rear, which were mainly focused on the sabotage of the communication lines. A few days after Walter Model's arrival, the Soviets were able to close a double bag in Minsk, and by July 3rd they had another 100,000 Germans in them. It should be noted that all the German soldiers who were being captured in this operation were the ones who, a little later, starred in the parade of prisoners in Moscow. On the other hand, some of these German soldiers were able to break out of the encirclement on their own and return to the German sector, but most ended up surrendering by July 8. As a curiosity, in the pocket that the Soviets made east of Minsk, they captured the German General Vincent Muller, who was in command of the German Fourth Army. This general had replaced Heinrichi at the beginning of June, days before the Soviet offensive began. Had this not been the case, it was likely Heinrichi who would have been captured, and he would not have been able to defend the German defenses in the Oder later. Going back to the situation at the front, we have to say that by mid-July, the Germans had lost about 25 divisions and about 300,000 men that they could never replace. Simply put, most of Army Group Center had been destroyed, and the worst was yet to come. Between July 16th and 18th, Two new offensives began that would end up giving the final blow to the Wehrmacht. The first was the one that started in the direction of Riga, to isolate the entire army group north, and the second the one that started further south in the direction of Warsaw. From here, at the beginning of August, the Germans carried out two counteroffensives with the few armored units they had left, and were able to establish a temporary corridor in Riga for the entire army group north to withdraw, and on the other hand, stop the Soviet advance to Warsaw. By early August, the casualty count for the last month and a half of fighting was as follows. The German army suffered some 400,000 dead, wounded and prisoners, while the Red Army lost almost 700,000 troops. As we can see, and despite the drama of the situation, the German army still managed to inflict heavy casualties on the Soviets, although this was done each time at a higher own cost. End of July 1944 The German army is on the brink of collapse, having suffered one of its biggest defeats since the war against the Soviet Union began. In barely a month since the start of Operation Bagration on June 22, the Germans have had more than 300,000 casualties and have fallen back up to 500 kilometers from their defensive positions east of Minsk. In the northern sector, Army Group North is on the verge of being encircled and isolated in present-day Estonia or Latvia. On the other hand, 
in the central sector, the Soviets have opened a large gap that is taking them directly to Warsaw in an unstoppable way. If they take the city, as well as the territory near it, it will be chaos for the Germans, and it will mean the total fall of the new front on the Vistula. This was without a doubt the most serious threat by far, as Warsaw had a direct road to Berlin, as well as a great railway line. Due to this, this was a very important place where there were facilities of all kinds, such as supply depots, numerous military hospitals or weapons factories. Thus, its loss would be a disaster for the Wehrmacht and would lead to a total logistical collapse. The German Marshal Walter Model, famous for his defensive actions and for his ability to solve situations of total collapse, was in command of the German Army Group Center, and once again he had to do his best to avoid this catastrophe. So throughout this program, we are going to see how he manages to organize a desperate counteroffensive with the depleted forces that he had, with which he was able to stop the Soviet advance against Warsaw. With that said, let's get started. On July 21, 1944, after an unstoppable advance through all of Belarus, the Soviets reached Lublin, and then launched a direct charge against Warsaw. This attack was led by the Soviet Second Guards Tank Army, which was integrated into the First Belarusian Front, under the command of General Rokossovsky. After five days of fighting, the Red Army broke through to the Vistula, and was located just 20 kilometers south of Warsaw. The Soviet plan was very ambitious, and consisted of attacking Warsaw from all sides with the aim of encircling it. Southwest in the first place, they would advance north along the eastern part of the Vistula River until they passed Warsaw, to later cross the river both north and south of the Polish capital, thus encircling the city. As we have said before, this action would destroy numerous German divisions in the area, and the entire German logistics system would collapse. As this Soviet advance was taking place, Walter Model was mobilizing for combat every man he could find, removing them from hospitals, offices, administrative posts, and in general, any men who were in the rear without fighting. With this action that was very typical of him, he tried to reinforce the entire front line while concentrating his panzer divisions to launch a strong counterattack in the area. Despite having to weaken other sectors of the front, Walter Model was able to concentrate at full speed four panzer divisions near Warsaw, with which he was to carry out his fierce counterattack. The first was the 19th Panzer Division which he brought up from the Białystok sector, which was northeast of Warsaw. This was joined by the 5th Panzer Division of the SS Weekang, together with the 4th Panzer Division, which also came from a sector near Białystok, after having suffered heavy losses in the fighting the previous month. And finally, Walter Model could count on the Hermann Göring Division that came from Italy to reinforce the Eastern Front. In total, these four divisions had about 300 armored vehicles between tanks and assault guns, which had to face about 800 Soviet armored vehicles from the Second Guard Tank Army. Thus, while the German Marshal was sending all these units to the vicinity of Warsaw, the Soviets broke through the front on July 29 and advanced at full speed to Radzimin, which is located about 20 kilometers northeast of the Polish capital. This Soviet penetration had been carried out in a frantic way, without consolidating or protecting any flank, which generated a marked salient in the front line. Although this left the Soviet Third Tank Corps in an exposed situation, the general staff of the 1st Belarusian Front did not consider that the Germans had enough forces to have to worry. In any case, this advance threatened to eventually cross the Vistula to the north of Warsaw, whereupon the Soviets could encircle the city. At the same time as this was taking place, the Poles began their uprising in Warsaw on August 1st, this also being the time when Walter Model began the first phase of his counterattack. This first action consisted of a pincer attack by the 19th Panzer Division attacking from the west flank, and the Waffen SS Weekang Division from the east flank, both heading towards Okunyu. This offensive was a complete success, and in just a few hours, the Germans managed to cut the entire line of communication of the Soviet Third Tank Corps, leaving it isolated from the rest of the Red Army units. Later the next day, the 4th Panzer Division joined the attack from the north, and the Hermann Göring Division from the south. With this they gave even more impetus to the German attack of the previous day, and increased the pressure on the Soviet troops trapped in the Radzimin salient. 
This was described as a perfect maneuver by Walter Model, in which he attacked concentrically with four panzer divisions, completely crushing his enemy. Thus, little by little the third Soviet tank corps was being squeezed, until it was practically annihilated. After completing this maneuver that took the Germans until August 3rd, the next day, the four panzer divisions began a new attack in a southeasterly direction, which finished off the rearguard units of this tank corps, which they had just destroyed. It is estimated that a total of 550 Soviet tanks were destroyed, out of the total of 800 that had started this flanking attempt on Warsaw. At the same time that this was taking place, the Soviets stopped the advance they were making on the area at a general level, and abandoned the idea of encircling Warsaw as they had planned. Similarly, they also made no attempt to open a land line of communication with Warsaw and support the Polish uprising, despite being only a few kilometers from the city. It is at this point that a great debate opens, about whether it was really this attack that really stopped the Soviet advance on Warsaw, or if it stopped because Stalin wanted to deny aid to the Poles. With this, he intended that the Germans themselves be in charge of eliminating the Poles loyal to the exiled government in London, instead of having to do it himself. In any case, it should be noted that although the Soviet advance on Warsaw stopped, the attacks continued with great intensity against East Prussia and against Army Group North, which was finally isolated in Kurland two months later. In any case, this victory was crucial at all levels. In the first place, Walter Model was able to save the entire German line of communications and supplies, avoiding the catastrophe that losing it would have entailed. Thus, he had saved Army Group Ukraine North which had been withdrawing from Lviv, just as he was able to save Army Group Center by allowing it to win a lull in the fighting and re-establish a new defensive line. Lastly, he was also able to maintain logistical contact with Army Group North, although later and as we have just said, he ended up being isolated in Kurland. Thus, after this loss of Soviet momentum that followed, the Germans could focus on putting down the Warsaw Uprising, which did not end until early October after leaving the entire city destroyed. Well, what we have seen is Walter Model's brilliant counteroffensive, which used the only maneuver that the Germans could do at that time. This consisted of hiring the largest number of mobile and armored forces in the sector, at the cost of weakening others, to later counterattack with the greatest force possible on the vanguard of the Soviet penetration. Early October 1944 On the Eastern Front, another great tragedy has just occurred for the German armies in Russia. Army Group North made up of most of the 16th Army and the 18th Army with a total of 33 divisions, has just been encircled and isolated in northwest Latvia, in what will be known as the Kurland Pocket. From this point, a titanic fight will begin on the Kurland Peninsula, which many have even described as senseless fighting, which will continue until even after the fall of Berlin. But how was this possible? What happened that Army Group North found itself besieging Leningrad in early January, and 10 months later found itself in this critical situation? Why, despite the request of many generals, were the troops not evacuated at any time? And finally, how were the fighting that took place in Kurland during the seven months that its siege lasted? Well, this is exactly what we are going to see next. To do this, let us first go back to January 1944. At this time on the Eastern Front, heavy fighting was taking place in the western part of Ukraine, after the crossing of the Dnieper River by the Soviets, as we recently saw on the channel. However, this was not the only offensive that the Soviet Union carried out, since on January 13th the Leningrad-Novgorod operation began, which this time was able to break through the German defenses of Army Group North. This, as you know, was something that they had been trying since the establishment of the German siege on Leningrad. Thus, this operation consisted of two large attacks that were launched in stages. The first began on January 13 from the Leningrad sector itself and from the surroundings of Novgorod, in a tenacious maneuver. After a month of combat, the Germans had to retreat to Narva, already on the border with Estonia, and to Lake Pipus. Later a month later, the Soviet attacks continued southwest of Novgorod against the German advance position that had remained in the sector, 
and drove them back to Pskov, which was also in the same line of defense of Lake Pipus. Despite this defeat, the new defensive position was more favorable for the Germans than the previous one, and it was practically the one that many commanders had been requesting for a long time. However, during the next few months Army Group South was severely crushed, to which must also be added the new front that opened in Normandy on June 6. This made the chances of reinforcement for Army Group North almost nil, and so it waited until the next Soviet summer offensive, which would break all previous records. During the summer of 1944, the Red Army was able to launch massive offensives across the entire Eastern Front, stretching from Finland to Romania. It was specifically Operation Bagration, which began on June 23rd, which would affect Army Group North, and which would end up leaving it isolated in Kurland. The first phase of the Soviet offensive focused on tearing apart Army Group Center in present-day Belarus, from which they began to pressure Group North by mid-July. The attacks began to the southeast of Riga, and concentrated on the weakest point of the new German salient that had formed on the Eastern Front, after the retreat of Army Group Center. Although the attacks that the Soviets were carrying out against Narva, or to the south of Pskov were not having much success, that was not the case in the one launched north of Kaunas, which in just 10 days managed to advance some 200 kilometers, and on August and reached the Gulf of Riga. With this, the entire Army Group North was isolated for the first time since the war had begun. This, as is natural, set off all the alarms in the German High Command, which tried by all means to remedy the situation. However, let us remember that on the same date the Americans had broken through the Normandy front at Evranche, and the fall of Warsaw hung in the balance. After some 20 days isolated in Estonia, without land communication with the rest of the German armies, by August 19, the Germans were able to reorganize and open a gap in the Soviet lines, which they reconnected with the troops that had been isolated. Thus, and although the situation was stabilized by the beginning of September, it became clear that the German situation in Estonia was already impossible to maintain. This led to the fact that during the month of September, the Germans began a general withdrawal under intense Soviet pressure. However, unfortunately for them, they did nothing more than get out of a desperate situation to find themselves in another just like it. By the beginning of October, once the withdrawal in Estonia had ended, most of these units were in the vicinity of Riga, where a huge bottleneck had developed. It was then that on October 5th, the Soviets began a new offensive further south, this time against the city of Memel, which is now known as Klaipeda. In the same way that they had done in their previous attack against the Gulf of Riga, the Soviets were able to reach the Baltic coast in just four days, and this time, they isolated the North German Army Group definitively. Regarding other encirclements that the German Army had suffered in recent years, it must be said that this one had in its favor that it could be supplied by sea, and that changed everything, since the divisions could be maintained in a state of optimal combat. However, this is where one of the key questions arises. What is the point of these more than 200,000 soldiers in Kurland, when at the end of 1944 it was the original borders of Germany that were threatened? The main reason given by the German leader was firstly, that this position in Kurland was necessary to defend the entire German Baltic coast. Secondly, it was believed that the pressure that the Soviets were going to exert in Kurland would not be made on the new Vistula front, so its defense would be more comfortable. This has been shown to be completely wrong, since the Red Army was capable of continuing to attack the Vistula front with total ferocity, and the most advantageous thing for the Germans would have been to have more men in order to have a deeper defense. Finally, Hitler hoped that in the future the war could take a new turn, and Kurland represented an ideal starting position to start an offensive on the rear of the Red Army. For their part, the Soviets, thinking that the Northern Group was very weakened and that it would not last long, began to launch offensives against it immediately. Thus, by October 13, the Germans had to abandon Riga, and retreat to a much shorter defensive line already in the Kurland Horn itself. The abandonment of Riga to occupy this new defensive position was one of the few concessions made to Schorner, who was the commander of this army group. 
It should also be noted that this was one of Hitler's favorite generals, due to his ability to resist statically in one position until the end. The first major Soviet offensive on Kurland occurred on October 27, and consisted of a powerful attack right on the center line of the German defense, in which 52 divisions were used. In addition, they also launched other attacks in the sector near the Baltic coast. However, despite the power of the offensive, the Soviets were barely able to advance five kilometers in a month, and the attack stopped. Taking into account that the Kurland Peninsula is about 80 kilometers deep, everything indicated that it was going to cost more than the account to expel the Germans from said territory. The next offensive against the Germans in Kurland began on December 21st, in a new strong Soviet attack that after a week of fighting failed to make any significant progress either, so it was cancelled. From the beginning of 1945, the situation had changed considerably compared to October, as the Red Army had made its way through the Balkans and had also reached the Hungarian capital. On the other hand, the last hope of the Germans on the Western Front had failed, and there was no longer any opportunity to deliver that strong thrust that could change the outcome of the war. Thus, the greatest concern now was on the Vistula Front, where a major Soviet offensive was expected that could even reach Berlin itself. This intensified the demands of generals like Guderian, who had been demanding for weeks that the German divisions be evacuated from Kurland. So this time they paid off and in mid-January seven divisions were evacuated from there. This was also the time when Army Group North was renamed Army Group Kurland. With this we have that the request for a total evacuation was definitively rejected forever. The next Soviet offensive against them occurred when they had also broken through the Vistula Front on January 23rd. Again and despite the fact that the Germans were now more weakened, they managed to repulse the Soviet attack. During the month of February the Red Army continued to attack Kurland, and this time they did achieve some victory over the Germans on the entire front line, even managing to pocket the German 126th Infantry Division at Precule. However, it was not something that the Germans could not solve, and after withdrawing a bit, they reconsolidated a new defensive line before which the Soviets had to paralyze again. It was during the month of March, specifically on the 18th, when the Soviets began their last major offensive against Kurland, which again did not achieve any positive results. This was already the straw that broke the camel's back for Stalin, who saw that despite the resources used since October 1944, he had achieved practically nothing in that sector. So he summoned the generals of the different Baltic fronts and ended up disbanding the last remaining Baltic front, and sent those troops to support the operations that were taking place near the Oder front. Thus, at the beginning of April, the Soviets gave up on conquering Kurland by direct military means, and focused solely on blocking and isolating the territory. After Hitler's death, Donitz gave the order to evacuate as many troops as possible from Kurland before the final capitulation, with the aim that they would not end up being taken prisoner by the Soviets. This is how some 20,000 soldiers were evacuated by sea from there between May 3rd and 8th. By May 9th, the remaining German troops in Kurland had finally surrendered, and the Soviets were able to capture a total of 189,000 German and 20,000 Latvian fighters. 284,000 casualties were those that the Red Army suffered during these seven long months of siege, in which it failed to break the German defenses in Kurland, compared to 117,000 Germans. Undoubtedly, this defense can be considered a German feat, which, while true, would have been much more effective on the Vistula or the Oder. From here begins a great debate about the importance of retaining up to nine Soviet armies trying to penetrate the German defenses in Kurland. Did this prevent progress on the rest of the Eastern Front from going faster? Would these troops have been of greater importance on the Vistula or the Oder? From my point of view, yes, but I let everyone answer these questions. If you want to see other battles that took place during this final phase of the conflict on the Eastern Front, I leave you the video of Walter Model's counteroffensive in Warsaw, and the video of the Botzen battle in the description. Thank you all for being part of this community, and especially the sponsors who make this possible. Subscribe and share this program if you liked it, 
and we'll see each other here as always, next Thursday and Sunday. See you soon.